Hey, everybody. This is Dayton Mayor Nan Whaley, and I'm so excited that you're listening to my very first podcast of Carry As You Climb. This podcast will be devoted to talking to amazing women leaders across the state and across our country in all different sectors, from politics to nonprofits to businesses. I am so excited to start this podcast, and actually the name comes from uh, a statement that Connie Schultz always says, the amazing Pulitzer Prize-winning writer uh, up in Cleveland. Connie always says that as women leaders, we have, to not, we have to not only climb the ladder, but we also have to carry other women along with us. And that's what we're trying to do with this podcast as we listen and share stories of women leaders, how they got there, and who they've brought up as well. I hope you enjoy the listen. This week, we're talking to former Ohio Supreme Court Justice Yvette McGee Brown. Yvette's career has been distinguished by her commitment to public service, particularly as Franklin County Common Police Court Judge and as a justice on the Ohio Supreme Court. We are here today with my dear friend, uh, Yvette McGee Brown, who's had a storied career, right, Uh, and continuing to do amazing things. Can't keep a job. (laughs) Like most women, right? right. They get stuff done. Keep on moving to the next thing. Uh, Your office is filled with pictures. Like I'm looking across the way with uh, Barack and you Mm -hmm. and just great folks of when you were on the Supreme Court. And uh, your uh, life of Ohio politics has been something else, Yvette. So thanks thanks for joining Carrie as you climb. (laughs) Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So as as I as we've talked before, this this uh, podcast is uh, all women in leadership doing all different kinds of things and their theories and thoughts around leadership mm-hmm. and how they feel uh, being a woman leader and if they had to impart some wisdom on folks, what they've really learned in that in that experience. Oh, and wow. okay. as someone I talk to all the time about leadership and my work in leadership is one of my uh, many uh, mentors in this work, I really am so glad that you decided to be on. Thank you. So we're here at Jones Day. You're a partner here in mm-hmm. uh, this law firm. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, when you ran for Supreme Court, being on the Supreme Court and that experience statewide. And mm-hmm. if someone was deciding to run for office, what would you tell them as a woman? What would you tell them? Oh, I'd say that they'd have to know, one, why they're running. And two, they have to be strong. I mean, running in any election, whether it's school board, county commissioner, mayor, or statewide, you have to be clear on why you're running and you have to be strong because there will be people that will say things about you. They'll try to hurt your feelings. There is no crying in baseball. There is no crying in politics. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> told me that too, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think being strong and not, to, you know, having a thick skin through yes. the process, right? Absolutely. And not taking yourself too seriously, right? I mean, I think what helped me and maybe helped you is I went home every night to a husband who did not let my ego get out of hand. He's like, <laughs> he's like, nobody's going to stand when you walk in the room, you know, go in there and figure out what we're going to do for dinner, you know? So really having somebody that is that common touch for you. And most often when you say, go figure out what you're doing for dinner, I'm like, well, what are you doing for dinner, dude? I've been working all day. So we... We had that kind of give and pull that helped our relationship have humor in it, and it gave me a soft place to land. I could come home every night and know that he was going to be there for me. And that's so important mm-hmm. to have that support system, whoever it is, right? Because it's tough out here. That's and, right. Uh, when you, when you think of the work you've done, from you know being a professional attorney in the private sector to running for statewide office to being a leader in nonprofit field. Mm-hmm. What has been something that's been really difficult, and how how did you move move through it? What's been really difficult? I, you know, the most difficult decisions I think I had when I was a public official, because, you know, when I, when you're in business, you're making difficult decisions, but it's, nobody's life hangs in the balance, right? Right. And if you do your job right as a public servant you're always thinking about the consequences to real people and understanding that the power you have to really change somebody's life or make a circumstance better, um, that that's pretty heady stuff. And there were many days where I prayed about a decision I was gonna have to render that was gonna send somebody to prison for mm-hmm. a long time. Um, or a decision where I thought a victim might not understand why I was making the decision. Wow. Those are difficult choices. And to, you know, to really sit and take time and think about that and think about the yeah. outcomes is, is a lot. It is. And you have to be, it's what we started with. You have to have that core piece of you that is comfortable with whatever decision is it, it is. Because you make the decision and you got to be willing to keep it moving. 
Yeah, and that's mm-hmm. I think that's a real key part of a le- of leadership really right. is being comfortable in your own skin and mm-hmm. comfortable that moving forward. Yes. Uh, well, we're so we're so lucky that you did serve, and uh, the work you're doing now is exciting too. I know that there's lots of women you continue to mentor and help along the way. And, yes. Uh, we're, I'm really excited to be one of those that count among one really? of those. Really? Absolutely. Oh, wow. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Yvette. Absolutely. Uh, so tell me one of the most fun things you've done in your career that you're like, I'm so glad I got this stu- got this done. Oh, riding on Air Force One. <laughs> tell me about it. I didn't know you did this. I did. Tell me um, why and how. <laughs> so when um, I was running for lieutenant governor with Governor Strickland, um, President Obama came into um, Columbus to do an event for us. And then we were going to fly with him to do an event in Cleveland. And so we got to fly on the plane with some other congressional leaders. And it was amazing. I mean, first of all, he is so genuine and so warm. But then we go back on the plane and, you know, where you sit back where the press normally sit and the congressional people and you they have all of these little like ink pads. Oh, really? You know, the M&Ms. I was going to ask, are the M&Ms on the Air Force One? (laughs) They are on the Air Force One. Air Force so cool. One. And so, you know, I'm sliding things into my bag from the ch- armchair. Yeah. And one of the stewards comes up to me and he goes, ma'am, we're going to give you a packet to take home. <laughs> That's so I was so embarrassed. And I was like, oh, I was doing it for my son. He loves these m and That's so great. Oh, I love it. I would do the same thing. I would do the same thing. Uh, how special. And he was just super terrific. Oh, he was so terrific. And then what was really fun, I will never forget this. Once the plane lands, you know, we walked out of the same door he walked out of coming down the tarmac, the governor and I did. So there's these line of people. You start to feel like the queen. You know they're not there for you. They're there for the president. Right. But you walk out in front of him down those stairs, and they're all just lined up, and you're just shaking hands like, you know, you can almost hear the music playing in the background. That's so cool. Cool. Yeah, it was a very cool experience. Yeah, you know, um, we long for the days of a president like Barack Obama these Absolutely. days, right? You yes. really, I mean, not only did you know you were in something special during his tenure, mm-hmm. but to compare it to today, Yo, there's just no comparison, really. Just, I mean, just, he was such a class act. I mean, you just, even you know, you didn't have to agree with everything he did, but when he was on the world stage, when he spoke to the nation, There was just a pride and a comfort knowing that whatever he was doing, he had thought about it. He had read the briefing books. Right. (laughs) He was making an informed decision. Yeah. It's it's really a true form of public service. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you said, you know, at the beginning that, you know, you have to decide if you why you want to run. Yes. For you, what was that decision like for you? What was what was really propelling you into to decide for to the go? Supreme Court? Yes. Yeah. It was interesting because um, when the governor first talked to me about it, I really wasn't sure that I wanted to be on the Supreme Court. But the more that I talked to the other justice, particularly chief justice, I started to think about what a great way to continue my public service. I'd been a trial court judge for nine years this would be adding on to that and surprisingly I like the work you know when you're a trial court judge it's very lonely it's just you right. making the decision but when you're on the Supreme Court you're one of seven so it was in a way like being back in law school again we're debating ideas and we're talking about cases and having co- these many moot courts about who's right, right who's wrong so it was really um, it was that I would like the work and then the other thing was how important it was for Ohio um, to be part of Ohio's history to have a small part in moving the state forward being the first woman of color to ever serve on the Supreme Court it was an opportunity that many of my advisors said you have to do this I mean it's 2011 we've been a state since 1803 right and we have not had a woman of color serve on the Ohio Supreme Court and so it was as much for me as for those who follow me to really say okay we're breaking another barrier here Um, and I actually thought about my grandmother And how proud she would be to see me take that step to take that seat on the state's highest court. Well, tell me about your grandmother. My grandmother was, um, she was an amazing woman, born in 1906 in the Jim Crow South. Uh, She came to Columbus when she was 17, and she took in laundry, worked in restaurants, raised eight children, Uh got them all through high school. Uh, But she was strong. She divorced my grandfather in the early 50s when women didn't do that. Right. But my grandfather was an alcoholic, and she said, 
I'd have to wait for him every Friday to get the paycheck or he'd drink it through all weekend. Mm. I just, I'd rather just do it by myself. And think about how courageous a woman with eight kids wow. in the early 50s. And she's like, I'm going to do this on my own because I can't go through this anymore. And she did it. And so I think I got a lot of my strength from her because she would always say to me, you go to school when you learn everything those people have to teach you. Because once they've taught it to you, they can never take it away. Oh. And she, she was... She had a ramrod moral compass. She did not suffer fools, and she did not allow you to feel sorry for yourself. (laughs) Wow, I'm getting chills thinking about her, Yvette. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And how long did she live? She lived until she was 78. She died um, in 1985. This is how strong she was. I was in law school. It was my third year of law school in in 1985. She got uh, diagnosed with colon cancer in April. Uh, an advanced form. My graduation was in May at Mershon Auditorium at Ohio State. The doctor told her not to go because there were too many steps and she didn't have enough strength. And she said, I am going. And she walked up every one of those steps defiantly to be in the commencement. I took the bar, got sworn in in November, November 4th of 85. And my grandmother died on Christmas Day, 85. Uh. I really believe she willed herself to see that. Um, And once she had seen me sworn in, she saw all of her children for the last time on that Thanksgiving. She lapsed into a coma the day after Thanksgiving and died on Christmas Day. Now that's strength. That is amazing (laughs) strength. And you're right, telling me what she did to witness what just uh, those accomplishments for you. To yeah. th- be thinking of uh, her granddaughter as a Supreme Court member for the state of Ohio is pretty powerful. I so wish she she had a way of knowing, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you're, you're definitely the American dream. Yeah. Right? <laughs> a version of a it. A version of it. <laughs> yes. That's right. Uh, so the, the name of the podcast, Carry As You Climb, is about how, as women, we're always climbing the ladder, but we have to carry women with us, mm-hmm. right? As you know, we still have to bring people along with us even while we're doing it. Yeah. And then we've also had people that have helped carry us, frankly. Absolutely. Nobody does anything alone. Absolutely. So when you think of, of your life, obviously your grandmother has been someone that's carried you. Mm-hmm. Who else has carried you, particularly in the professional sector, that has made a difference, men, man or woman? Oh, I've, I've been fortunate to have a number of mentors. I mean, um, Donna James is one. Janet Jackson oh, yeah, was Janet. an early mentor. Um, she was. She interviewed me for my first job when I was still a law student. Did she really? Uh, yeah, and she was the one who said to me, you know, you've got to get involved with your community. You just can't go to work and go home. And so Cindy Lazarus, who was yeah. the president of city council here, she was one of the first campaigns that I worked on. I mean, I've had so many amazing women who have allowed me to be a small part of their journey and then who have poured back into me the things that I needed to learn as I advanced in my career. Well, I think there's something special about Columbus, mm-hmm. too. Uh, you know, my friends in Dayton, we kind of talk about, especially in Columbus, there's this girl magic that yes. we call <laughs> that, you know, you all really support each other and celebrate each yes. other and really mentor. It's a special uh, a special place here. Yes, I feel that. I feel very fortunate to, to be part of this community because even in the legal community, it's very collegial, it's very professional, and you do, you feel this sense of everybody's willing to give you advice to help you move forward, and I try to do that with the young people that I mentor or have engagement with now. And yeah, and it's where a lot of young people are moving into. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like one of the few places where in the state where We're we see a lot of young <laughs> young people uh, moving. Who are some of your uh, mentees that you're really proud of that you've helped carry? (laughs) So, you know, I've got a lot of young women in in Columbus and then across the law firm. So I started about five years ago having a quarterly dinner with um, black women who work in law firms. Awesome. And so we get together for dinner once a quarter. There's Unfortunately, there's only about 14 of us, but those young women are women that I just want them to know each other, to have relationship, because we're not competitors. There's enough work for everybody. Absolutely. But you need to have your professional relationships. I have young women across the firm, uh, one in our LA office, Casey Hemphill. She's a NYU uh, law grad. She clerked uh, for a federal 
federal judge, and she is a smart young lawyer that I helped recruit to the firm, and I can't wait to watch where she goes. Um, I have older women who are mid mid level attorneys who are in their early forties that I've known since law school. It's just it makes me feel good to have relationships with them. What so this quarterly dinner that you did mm-hmm. you did five years ago? What prompted you to say we need to do this more formal kind of thing? Well, because when I joined Jones Day here in Columbus, there wasn't another black lawyer in my law firm, okay. and I thought, you know, for me, I had lots of relationships, but it occurred to me that if I'm a young associate sitting in another law firm where there's nobody that looks like me, I might be really lonely. And so I thought, this is easy to do. Let's get everybody together. You plan it far enough out in advance where you get it on people's calendars. And it was just about creating community. That's really great. How many how many people come together? It's about 14. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really great. It is. It's it's something that I think we all look forward to. And we don't talk about the law or our firms. We just sit and gossip and laugh and... It's just that's fun. that's so great. I and women that do that for other groups, I mm-hmm. I think it's just it's just so cool. So yeah. thank you for doing that. I, that's really that's really awesome. Thank you. So we, before we wrap up for each uh, each uh, uh, podcast, we uh, even in our infancy, we've decided this. <laughs> uh, we wanted to ask two questions, okay. and uh, the first question we have, since we are Ohioans, is when you think of the word of Ohio, what comes to your mind? Home. I mean, it's 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 the place where I was born and raised. Um, it's the place that has given me so much opportunity. It's actually what drives me. I don't like the caricature of Ohio that I hear on the national news. Mm-hmm. This is a place that gave a kid born to a teenage single mother um, who had no career prospects the ability to end up on the Ohio Supreme Court. Um, it's a place I love, and I'm committed to doing my part to make it better so that that next kid who's sitting in, in an elementary school somewhere, who comes from a single-parent family, who doesn't see a vision of themselves reflected anywhere, still believes that they, too, can be on the Supreme Court. They can be a CEO. They can be a doctor. They can be a mayor. That's really what keeps me driving, and it's why I stay in Ohio. Well, we're so lucky that you do. Thank you, Yvette. The last question I have is when you think of women leaders, any time, born, uh, still alive, or in the past, who is your favorite of all time? So my the answer, I'm going to give you two. So my favorite of all time is Harriet Tubman. Uh, yep. I love Harriet Tubman because I think of her. She was a small woman in stature, but I can't imagine that I would have the courage she had if I had escaped slavery that I would have the courage to go back and take that journey all of those different over times. And over again. Yeah, yeah. That that to me is a level of fearlessness that I can't even imagine. So when people say, who would you ever like to have dinner with? She'd be one. I just would want to know what makes you do that, right? Right. And then I just finished reading Michelle Obama's book. Great book. And to me, she be, she was somebody who became a reluctant leader mm-hmm. and found her voice. I love how vulnerable she is in the book, how she talks about failing the bar exam the first time, um, people talking about her and how that wounded her, um, slip up she made when, when she first started to campaign for her husband, and how she came back. You know, how she put it all together, how she listened and learned, and in the process, role modeled not just for herself, but for her girls and for other women. And so I'm much more impressed with her now than I was even before. And the thing that she said, and this goes back to my Ohio, that, that stuck with me in the book is she said, fear is a feeling before it is a reality. And I think about poor kids not fear, I'm sorry, failure. Mm -hmm. I think about poor kids, that failure is a feeling before it's a reality. And poor kids who have that feeling of failure because people don't invest in them, people don't believe in them, that feeling is there before it becomes a reality. To me, that's profound. It was a small sentence in her book, but it resonated with me. That's really true Mm because, you know, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's exactly right. Right. That's exactly right. That's powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, the book is getting lots of great reviews. Yeah. And I think I've noticed it's starting to move a lot of women, too. So I think she'd be really proud of that. I, I think because, you know, nobody is born thinking they're going to be a leader. And the people who are born thinking they are leaders should not be. That's what I was just going to say. <laughs> I was just going to say. 
to say. And if you think that when you're born, maybe you should rethink right. yourself. <laughs> but the fact that she was so willing to, she she married a man, um, could not have imagined, she did the swerve, could not have imagined her life was going to turn out this way. But, you know, you got to be open to what comes your way and be willing to tackle it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what we all got to do, right? Yep. Well, I'm so grateful you've agreed to be on. And thank you so thank much you. for sharing just a little bit of you with uh, the listeners of this podcast and with me. It means a lot. Thank you, Nan. Have a great day. All right. You too. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Carrie As You Climb. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at Carrie Climb Pod. Also, visit our website at carryasyouclimbpod.com to sign up for our latest updates. Also, please, please subscribe and rate us on wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.